Nigeria records 1,056 new coronavirus cases and 21 deaths on Tuesday. A military report shows some Boko Haram host communities actually act as informant, leaking troop movement plans and helping the terrorists lay land mines. In international news, U.S. former President Donald Trump's second impeachment trial began on Tuesday with adulation to House impeachment managers and derision for Trump's lawyers. And in sport, FG to fund Edo 2020 Festival as the new date sets in. This is ANN News. I am Ola Jumoke Olatuji. Nigeria has added 1,056 new COVID-19 infections to its tally on Tuesday. This brings the total number of confirmed cases to 141,447. Said 21 new COVID-19 related fatalities were also announced, increasing the death toll to 1,694. Lagos posted 214, Oshun 120, and the Federal Capital Territory 116. Four states posted cases in high double digits, while three states had cases in the mid to lower double digits. Edo, Oyo, Kano, Delta, Katsina, Bernou, and Nasara were reported cases in mid to lower double digits. Ogwan Ekisi tied with eight cases each. Bauchi had four. Benue and Jigawa reported one each. And CDC reports 115,755 patients have been discharged. A study of the activities of the Boko Haram terrorist group has been quoted as reporting the concern among Nigerian military operatives over Boko Haram use of host communities as informants. The study is said to have identified locations where communities solidly assist the terrorists. These communities are said to have leaked to terrorist soldiers' movement. Those communities are also said to harbor the terrorists in their homes, settlements. They are also said to help Boko Haram in planting improvised explosive devices. Intelligence is said to have revealed that military operations are being undermined by civilians in at least 13 local government areas in parts of Adamawa, Bernou, and Yobe states. The study could not establish the incentives offered to those communities by Boko Haram to sabotage those who are on a mission to liberate them from the insurgents. Former Vision Minister Stella Odua, along with some of her aides, is facing new charges filed by the federal government in an alleged 10 billion naira fraud case. The government has also lumped in a Chinese firm for complicity in alleged monitoring of the multi billion naira fraud. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, filed the first charges at the Abuja Federal High Court. Those listed as Odua's co-defendants include Gloria Odita, who was to Emmanuel Namdi, Chukuma Irene Chiyere, Global Offshore and Marine Limited, Tip Top Global Resources Limited, Crystal Television Limited, Sobora International Limited, and China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation, Nigeria Limited. The defendants are charged with conspiracy, money laundering, and maintaining anonymous bank accounts with First Bank. Odua was absent for the first mention of the charge on Tuesday before Justice In Young Equo. FCC attorney Hazen Ligman Stan asked the courts to adjourn the case because Odua had not been served with a charge. The case was adjourned for two weeks. The recent decision by the Central Bank of Nigeria to seize the operation of cryptocurrency traders in the country is generating concerns from those affected, although the CBN says it is to safeguard the country's financial systems against fraudsters. Affected groups are afraid of losing the money they have already invested. Correspondent Philly Hazard reports. Ayola Daudu has been trading in cryptocurrency for eight years. 
He teaches other young beginners to trade as well. He says the recent ban by the government on crypto trading in Nigeria has cast doubt on the business. Instead of our people are panicking, and it's not good for the business anyway, because you don't want to put your money, you want to withdraw your money, and so many people are complaining. And um, for, for me, I believe it's quite challenging. Because Cryptocurrency is a digital medium of exchange also called crypto coins, created by programmers for businesses to transact. It's different from the conventional currencies like the Naira or dollar because it's a set of numbers unique to the owner and cannot be regulated by financial institutions. The Central Bank of Nigeria says many criminals could launder money through cryptocurrencies as a way to avoid government scrutiny. They can't regulate the supply, they can't print it, you know, they can't determine its value, they can't track who owns a cryptocurrency and who doesn't own a cryptocurrency. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's something that they are still trying to learn about, they are still trying to adapt to. And for that reason, the Nigerian Central Bank and, you know, central banks in a couple of countries are a bit wary of, of crypto. Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency released in 2009, is now valued at over $45,000 per Bitcoin. And within the last five years, Nigerians have traded in more than half a billion dollars worth of Bitcoins, making it the second highest trading country after the US. That's according to a top Bitcoin trading platform, Paxful. With the notable rise in value of cryptocurrencies, many Nigerians now see it as a digital asset to make extra income and investments, especially as the country's economy is currently under recession and unemployment rate is at record highs. Although crypto traders in Nigeria may not necessarily lose their investment, they may not be able to buy or withdraw the coins directly into their Naira accounts while the ban holds. Experts say the government may need to develop ways to adopt the currency as a legal tender, just like the US, so that citizens can take advantage of the benefits of crypto. People are investing in crypto as a way to hedge against inflation. You know, you don't want to keep your money in Naira. Today, inflation is 15.7%. People are trying to protect protect their protect their their earning power right and so people are investing in crypto you can't just wipe all these benefits away you know with a stroke of, of a regulation it's important to innovate around it that's something crypto traders like ayola are hoping the government does soon so that more people can trade easily with crypto in nigeria one million for every investors for every rich people yeah they don't look at the short time investment Coming up, African stories. Zimbabwe's streak of good news punctuated by COVID-19's battering of its small businesses. And later, international news. U.S. former President Donald Trump's second impeachment trial began on Tuesday. You are watching ANN. Somewhere in the world, every second of the day, news is happening. And of course, Nigeria is bustling with news day and night. That is why ANN doesn't sleep. Our eyes are peeled, wide open, so no story escapes our radar. We stay abreast of world events and happenings at home. We keep you up to the minutes in the world of sports. We give you information to stay on top of your investments and all the hard facts you need to navigate your day. If you miss us on air, you can keep up to date on our website and on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. We are ANN African News Network. We do news right in a truly African spirit. Welcome back, this is ANN News. COVID-19 effect is being felt in South Africa's gold sector. The pandemic is causing outputs to fall. Production declined by 14% in 2020. Correspondent Angela Coppola reports.
We move on to other stories. Zimbabwe is juggling between good and bad news as it reveals in the news of reduction in inflation rate and that its economy would actually grow this year. It is also seen under the news that COVID-19 has decimated small businesses in the country, businesses that are supposed to be the country's mainstay. Correspondent Faraya Uwakotuya reports. It's named easy. But things have been anything but in recent months. COVID-19 restrictions have left the once bustling watering hole teetering because despite being closed, it's still saddled with expenses like rent and wages. I've been forking out quite a lot of money from my own pocket now. Um, I can't keep doing that. All right. Yes, I'd love for us to reopen, to restock, you know, trade as normal, but if there's no money, what do we do? So unfortunately, that means a lot of my staff are going to be out of jobs, definitely. A second wave of COVID-19 has spread exponentially, forcing a hard lockdown under which only essential services are permitted. There is a concern when we consider the fact that most of our economy is primarily small to medium or micro, small and medium sized enterprises uh, will survive on day-to-day -day takings as it were this now presents a dilemma in terms of um, if you are reducing government services um, and you are also uh, on a on a continuing lockdown um, there are some serious ramifications in terms of the social welfare aspect of things small businesses are desperate for a reprieve well it certainly feels like we don't matter because right now, all policies are in favor of the large businesses. Any uh, regulation that's being implemented will suit the big organizations, not SMEs. As SMEs, we are struggling. We need to allow people to trade within certain limits under the lockdown so that we can generate money and not starve. People are starving outside. I'll be honest with you. The hardships are forcing some to defy the rules. I'm on a street in downtown Harare that is home to hundreds of small vehicle spare shops. Now their shop fronts are all locked up like this, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing going on here. Ostensibly milling around idly, traders are still engaging motorists to make a sale. The survival strategy is working for them, but others aren't coping as well. So it's, it's just a mess right now. It's, it's a nightmare, I'll be very honest. I don't even know if we'll be able to, to reopen. <laughs> That's the truth. Which makes for an uneasy road ahead. COVID-19 effect has been felt in South Africa's gold sector. The pandemic is causing outputs so far. Production declined by 14% in 2020. And correspondent Angela Coppola reports. The issue facing the South African gold mining and general mining sector is the lack of good government policy. When you see a lot of the economists and you see a lot of the mining industry people saying, policy, policy, we need to improve our policies. That, that is the single most important factor. Why is there no investment going in our gold mines and why does our production continue to shrink? Others believe the decline is also due to structural issues. Well, I think it's been 20 years in the making, so I think we should acknowledge it is structural. Our mines are getting deeper. The cost of production has gone up, sometimes because of depth, sometimes because of inefficiencies like ESCOM's power increases, etc. Um, and then obviously um, society has demanded much higher safety standards, uh, correctly so, and that has increased the cost of production. And so there are several examples of the impact that good policy has on the mining sector. We saw tens of billions of dollars flood into Zambia which is not even a small percentage of what South Africa is. We saw tens of billions of new foreign investment go into the DRC. We saw probably about $10 billion go into Tanzania, which hardly anybody knew even had minerals. So it shows what policy change, the right policy can do. Local regulations are not keeping pace with the changes in the mining sector, it's claimed. There are regulatory issues. So as the previous generation of mines gets mined out, we are not regulating for new mines. I'm told that there are significant opportunities of shallow mining, open cast mining under Witwatersrand, the northern, um, uh, the 
the sort of East Rand and the West Rand, but also in the Pilgrim's Trust area. But these are all caught up in regulatory sort of delays. Gold production is hitting an all-time high this year. Gold production has been hitting an all-time high for every year for the last 30 years. Now, somebody should ask, why is it hitting an all-time high? Why is every country on the planet producing more gold today than it was yesterday? And tomorrow they'll be producing more. Why are all those countries producing more and the country that had more than half the world's gold is producing less each day? The gold mining industry in South Africa has been in decline for a number of years now. And much of the reason for that has been blamed on the lack of good policy. Hopefully government will see the light. The Rwandan government has lifted a total lockdown in Kigali City earlier in post to slow the spread of COVID-19. Activities resumed on Monday, the first day of reopening. The world's limited number of passengers at various bus parks across the country, even though people were moving in different parts of the city. We missed moving around and we were tired of spending the day sleeping at home. I went to Kibagabaga and came back, and I have now come back to the market. Moving around is definitely different than when we are staying at home. We are glad that the lockdown has been lifted. It was a different atmosphere for service providers such as banks and telecommunications service providers after the lockdown was lifted. Minister for Local Governments, Professor Shiek Atastasi, says although some activities have resumed and the lockdown has been lifted in Kigali, residents should be mindful and practice measures to stop the spread of the pandemic. Rwanda has confirmed nearly 17,000 cases of coronavirus and 226 deaths. Nearly 13,000 patients have recovered. When we return, international news. U.S. former President Donald Trump's second impeachment trial began on Tuesday with adulation to House impeachment managers and derision for Trump's lawyers. And later, sport, FG to fund a Do 2020 festival. You are watching a n Welcome back. This is in News. The first day of the second impeachment trial of U.S. former President Donald Trump was a show of contrast. House impeachment managers were lauded for their well, very well presented and powerful case against the former president. But Trump's lawyers received thumbs down in all areas. Before the presentations began, a vote was taken on whether it was even constitutional to hold the trial since Trump is no longer in office. By 56 to 44, and six Republicans joining the Democratic majority, the Senate agreed it was constitutional. Trump has been accused of inciting insurrection when the Capitol building was attacked last month. Democrats prosecutes in the case opened Tuesday's proceedings by showing a dramatic video montage, montage rather, of Trump's speeches that encouraged and fanned the flames of the deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol by a mob of his supporters. The House impeachment manager said this incitement of insurrection amounted to high crime and misdemeanor. Trump's lawyers appeared to have been unprepared for the barrage of points raised by the accusers. Even the former president was said to have been surprised at what many Republican senators had called a dismal and shameful performance. One of Trump's lawyers even commended the House Democrats for their pre presentation. A trial continues today. Massive protests in Myanmar have now entered their fourth day. Police in the capital, Mintadar, fired gunshots into the air on Tuesday to disperse demonstrations against the ruling military. Witnesses say protesters were running away as weapons were fired into the air. It is reported the gunshots were fired away from the direction of the crowd. Police initially used water cannon and tried to push a large crowd back.
but demonstrators responded with projectiles. The march has defied a ban on gatherings of five or more persons and threats from coup leader Senior General Mi On Loin to take action against large rallies. Protesters are opposing a military coup that removed the elected governments last week. They are demanding the release of elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi, along with senior officials of her National League for Democracy Party. They were arrested when the military seized power and declared a year-long state of emergency on the first day of this month. The delay by Pfizer pharmaceutical company and AstraZeneca in delivering vaccine supplies to the EU has caused a shortfall in Europe. Portugal and Germany are facing prolonged rollout delays, but Brazil has had to close vaccination centers. Respondents Ross Collin reports. This is how the vaccination center in the town of Lohansi looked last month. An empty sports hall requisitioned by the mayor and ready to be turned into a vaccine hub. The injection booths and consultation areas have since been set up, but there's still nobody here. Problems with the supply of vaccines mean the doses allocated for the town have been diverted elsewhere. For the mayor, frustration over the slow process and there's no fixed date for when he can open the centre. The feeling here in this town is when everything has been done, everything, with all the logistics, all the healthcare workers, the elected officials, when they're ready to create something exceptional, we're obviously frustrated, we are annoyed, because when we promise something to the people, we have to take responsibility and keep our promises. Josiane was due to get the shot, but instead, she's now back on a waiting list. I'm really disappointed that the vaccination centre is closed. I made an appointment to go a long time ago, calling City Hall, and I know the mayor has done his best to get the vaccines. I really needed to get vaccinated, so I'm anxious, having to wait without knowing when I can get the jab. As the vaccination program has hit a roadblock, so too has this electric car. It was meant to be used to reach vulnerable people who cannot come into the centre. Now it's parked and out of use. There are 15,000 people in the town of Lohansi, and 2,500 of them are over the age of 75 and are eligible now for a vaccine which has still not arrived. The government paints an optimistic picture with new vaccines coming on stream soon, but the reality is interrupted supply chains, debilitating logistics and vaccination centres which are ready but not able to be used. The government hopes that overall 4 million people will get their first jabs by the end of this month. But in the eastern Paris suburbs, that message of positivity is clouded by a picture of delay and disruption. Up next, sport. FG to fund a Do 2020 festival as new date sets in. Please stay with us. You are watching ANN. We are on the road every day, canvassing throughout Africa for news you really need. We follow this story everywhere, from every corner of Nigeria to the wide African expanse. We bring you what's making headlines, we connect you with news you can use. ANN, African News Network, in a truly African spirit. Welcome back, this is ANN News in Sport. The federal government says it is ready to fund the rescheduled Edo 2021 festival. Sports Minister Sunday Diary stated this after Monday's emergency meeting of the National Council on Sport, which had in attendance state sport commissioners, directors of sport, permanent secretaries and the deputy governor of Edo State, Philip Shoaibo. The council resolved that it was best to shift the date because of financial challenges. The federal government, Edo State and the council agreed that the festival will now hold in April. 12D Tigers boys have been picked for the final phase of camping ahead of the 2021 FIBA Afro Basket qualifiers kicking off in Tunisia. In a week, Niger sits comfortably on top of Group B after beating Rwanda, Mali and South Sudan. Nigerians are expected to be treated to champagne basketball when the players converge on Monastir for the third window after six players from France were handed a call up. 
That's SZN News this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, annafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. I am Olajumoke Olatunji. Have a pleasant evening.